It is well known the Catholic Church, after hundreds of years of regret and neglect, finally exonerated Galileo. This is the story of St. George Jackson Mivar, a one-time correspondent with Charles Darwin, who was initially honored by the Church for his scientific achievements. Mivar sympathized with Darwin's theory, but eventually became a strong critic of evolution because he feared it would encourage the general public to believe the soul evolved rather than being created by God. Although he was a principal scientific critic of Darwin's theory, he was excommunicated on his deathbed for not fully denying the principles upon which Darwin arrived at his momentous theory. This is his story, a story of injustice and redemption. Galileo's Dilemma and He Who Drinks Boiling Tea are written and produced as radio theater by Craig Gosling, Steve Dewar, and Matt Barron. They can be found on greygoosegosling.wordpress.com and are available without charge for secular purposes. St. George Jackson Mavar's shoulders throbbed with pain as if they had been dislocated again. It wasn't the first time he had been hung up by his arms until shoulder ligaments and tendons painfully stretched and tore apart. In addition, the third degree burns on his back and buttocks were the reason he now lay prone in bed in Dante's infirmary with a clean white sheet lightly covering him. True, the torture session had gotten a little out of hand again, but Mivar knew that whatever happened, he ended up in the infirmary to recuperate before being returned to his dungeon cubicle. The brief infirmary stay was a godsend, so to speak, for several reasons. Dante's infirmary was the only place Mivar ever got to meet and converse with another person. Loneliness causes much pain as scorched skin. The infirmary also provided a short reprieve from the harsh conditions of his dirty little cubicle. Today, as usual, the infirmary ward was almost full. As far as his eyes could see, there were cots containing sheet-covered patients. A muffled moan emanated from under the sheets of the cot to his right. Mivar painfully inched his way to the edge of the bed and swung his feet to the floor. He was desperate to talk to anyone about anything, but especially about science. If he was lucky, a patient might be a new arrival and would have news of new scientific achievements from the world above. Little black imps scurried around doing chores. The imps changed the bed linens, cleaned the floors, and distributed food trays. Their tails twitched aimlessly as if they were no longer under the imp's control. In spite of his pain, Mivar could not help but laugh whenever these unruly vestigial appendages accidentally knocked over a bedpan or tripped them up. The imp's uncooperative tails and small stature made it difficult for them to change the bed linen without climbing up on the beds and sometimes tumbling off. They made high-pitched squeaking complaints when they were frustrated, but they never threatened the patients. The imps didn't seem to care or even acknowledge Mivar's attempts to communicate with other patients. Mivar gingerly shuffles to the edge of the nearest occupied bed. He pulls back the sheet to see who it is. Mivar knocks on the bed frame. Hello. Anyone home? Who in hell are you? What do you want? Your face is familiar, my friend. Who do I have the honor of addressing? The frail old man in the bed rises up on one elbow to get a better look at who is bothering him. Uh, I am, <clears throat> I was, the Vice Admiral of Her Majesty's Royal Navy, Robert Fitzroy. Now please, refrain from bothering me while I try to recover from my latest wounds. God damn you, just leave me alone! <sighs> Ah, oh, my good Vice Admiral, it is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, even as you recover from your wounds and unjust treatment. No, no, there were no injustices done to me. Alas, I suffer here in hell for good reason. I took my own life. It is just that God punish me for that terrible sin. I deserve it. Now leave me alone. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I have never talked to anyone who successfully committed suicide. <laughs> My friend, you well know that you will very soon recover as you always have before. 
Tomorrow you will be rested and ready for the torture chambers again. We are always healed so we may feel new pain. Satan is clever, is he not? Or is it God we should blame? Fitzroy struggles to a sitting position in spite of his pain. It appears the evil one sent you to me so I can be further tortured by your asinine babble. Ah, that is very possible, my friend, but I too have been tortured as you have. I find conversation takes my mind off the pain. I am St. George Mivar, scholar, professor, scientist, and one-time colleague of Charles Darwin. That last statement gets Fitzroy's complete attention, as if he were slapped in the face. So you knew that scoundrel Darwin? Now I am sure you are a worthless and evil person. Darwin is the reason I took my life, and why I now reside in hell, undergoing daily torture. Any friend of Darwin's is my enemy. Be gone, fool! Leave me to my suffering! Forgive me, Fitzroy. I did not say I was Darwin's friend. I was at one time, but when I fully comprehended the tragic consequences of his evolution theory, I repudiated my friendship and association with the man and became his greatest critic. I am most proud of that very fact. Hmm. You may have some moral virtue after all, Mava. Well, how do you know the infamous Professor Darwin? He was a young and misguided lad who brought liberal ideas aboard my ship and infected my crew. He believed in the equality of all men, even Negroes. Imagine that. Imagine that. He even was critical of the Bible's acceptance of slavery. He was an immature heretic in the making. Ah, oh, yes, now I remember your face. Did not you and Darwin publish a book together about your adventures? Uh, the Voyage of the Beagle, was it not? I read it, but I do not recall any mention about his heretical beliefs on evolution. True. At that time, those sacrilegious beliefs were still incubating in his evil mind and were not published until years later, after Alfred Wallace sent Darwin his own evolutionary papers. Thereafter, Darwin published his books, The Origin of Species and The Descent of Man. I must admit it, I am to blame for Darwin's theory. Well, how so, Admiral? I invited him to join me on the Beagle, and I provided him the opportunity to collect those accursed specimens and fossils. My misjudgment of his moral character is the reason mankind now battles with the blasphemy of evolution. And that is why you took your own life? Of course! I could not live with guilt. He and Huxley drove me crazy with their continual blasphemies. They published papers and books about evolution, and they lectured about it. There was nothing I could do to stem the tide of their infectious lies and undo the harm I had allowed. I, I take it, Admiral, uh, that you are a believer in the literal truth of the Bible? Of course. If you are a critic of Darwin, you too must believe as I do, do you not? Well, Fitzroy, let me explain. My major criticism pertained to the effect evolution was having on the morality of the nation. Evolution confuses the average man. It has a sinister effect on humanity. It undermines religion. Evolution of the animal body is something to be debated, but evolution of the soul is quite impossible, and that was my concern. Darwin and Huxley preached blasphemy to the world. They claimed body and brain evolved together. Damn them to hell. But I have a hunch that neither of them are here. Such is God's justice. A curse upon you, Mavar. Don't speak ill of the Lord. You should not have compromised with Darwin's satanic views. Not in the slightest. 
Genesis is the only book of any value. All the truth one needs is to be found in the good book. The origin should be burned. I, in fact, have purchased and burned six copies. The conversation between the two men continues on into the evening. Fitzroy becomes more irrational, occasionally working himself into a rage, loudly quoting biblical passages. Mivar, a man of distinction and moderation, sympathizes with the distraught admiral, but is not about to give up the scientific facts and methodology upon which evolution is based. For the most part, he believed in the scientific methodology, but only when convenient. It all depended on where science led him. Hmm, what are you looking at, Fitzroy? Do you find something amusing about my appearance? No, no, Miva. I am a strong believer in phrenology. It's just that you have interesting cranial features. Ha <laughs> ha! Surely you don't accept phrenology as a science. <laughs> Phrenology is a true science backed by evidence. The facial features of Negroes easily identifies them as less than human, closer to chimpanzees, and the lumps and bumps on the skull are a good indication of intelligence and morality, as evidenced by the horns protruding from Satan's own head. I am surprised a man of your scientific background does not believe in its veracity. Oh no, you can't be serious. I can tell by your forehead you are a skeptic as was Darwin. Prior to my choosing the young Darwin to accompany me on my voyage, I noted the deficiencies of his head and I told him so. Most fascinating. So, what what exactly did your observations tell you about uh, the young man? Darwin's nose and forehead were quite primitive. His features showed low morality, sparse honesty, and minimal intelligence. I almost did not select him as my voyage companion, but time was short, and the Beagle was being outfitted for a near sailing date. It was my greatest mistake and one I will never forgive myself for. By now, Mavar thought his infirmary companion was totally balmy. The evolution of the body seemed reasonable to Mavar, although much of what Darwin and Huxley preached had yet to be explained. To Mavar, there is little doubt that the body was created by natural processes, but the soul was different. It could only have been created by the good Lord. The soul was what separated man from beast. His studies confirmed the truth of a God-designed evolution. It could not be denied, but Darwin's godless evolution message was a blight upon humanity. This, however, was not the time to debate evolution with his emotional companion. Mivar guided the conversation under different subjects as best he could. The lights in the infirmary finally sputtered out, telling him it was time to sleep. The two men were destined never to meet again, although Mivar would eventually plead to Satan for Fitzroy's redemption. For Fitzroy, tomorrow would be little different from the preceding days of suffering. He would continue to harvest the bitter fruit of his irrational faith. He has chosen his fate. But for Mivar, tomorrow would be momentous. Meanwhile, on the bottom floor of Satan's kingdom sat a little innocuous balding man with his feet propped up on a smoldering desk. He had been deep in thought all of the evening. Inasmuch as there was no one to talk to, he usually expressed his thoughts to the little imps that infested hell and served him. They were everywhere, always ready to listen to and obey their master. Several imps now lingered around Satan's desk and faithfully listened to him, although their understanding of his words were minimal. Satan spoke out loud to them, but mostly to himself. Most of my guests do not deserve eternal damnation and the grievous torments I invent for them. Many have been tortured in real life, died hideous deaths, and already suffered too long. So why is it necessary to make them suffer endlessly? It's true I enjoy causing pain, but it's like beating a dead horse. Oh well, it's not my call. I do my duties as God commands, 
torturing helpless souls for thousands of years has lost its excitement and become quite boring. There must be more to my existence than torturing those who cannot fight back. Where is the challenge and the satisfaction in that? The recent Galileo affair had been quite entertaining and satisfying for Satan. It was a change of pace from his boring responsibilities and an opportunity to give God a hard time. Satan had been studying the Innocence file folder on the computer screen ever since Galileo had been deleted from his questionable sinner file. He had clicked the top name on the list, a St. George Jackson Mivar, and been studying his file. Hmm. Here is a case that any good American trial lawyer would love to get his hands on. It is clearly an example of a gross miscarriage of moral justice, carried out by ignorant clergy who cared more about retaining their personal power and the prestige of the church than finding the truth. The Mavar case is even more embarrassing than the Galileo fiasco. <laughs> Satan reviews the computer files before him. Hmm. So, Mavar was a Catholic convert who had distinguished himself as a scientist and philosopher in the mid-19th century for his substantial contributions to humanity and support of Catholic doctrine, Pope Pius IX conferred on him the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Six weeks before Mavar's death in 1900, he was excommunicated from the church and condemned to the eternal fires of hell. Satan's internet research is temporarily interrupted by a conversation on his computer screen. Quiet, you idiot imps! Mavar is currently having a conversation with the crazy Admiral Fitzroy in the infirmary. I want to hear. Pour me more boiling water. A sly smile creeps across his chubby face as he listens. A drop of perspiration drips from his pudgy nose into his cup unnoticed as he listened. Hmm. I wonder what Fitzroy would find interesting in my face. The casual face I now wear would probably bore him, but my formal face with horns would no doubt get that crazy fool's attention. What an ass. It appears that Satan is slowly hatching a plan. As for Mavar, I like the man. He struggles like most humans with the conflicts between science and religion. I may be able to convince him to repudiate his belief in God and thereby free him from this hell he now endures. I could give him the Galileo treatment. Wouldn't that be a wonderful embarrassment to the Lord? Mavar does not deserve my special hospitality. He is innocent of all charges against him. The church that condemned him has since accepted the very dogma that originally convicted him. Satan turns to an imp and rhetorically asks, what was it that caused Mavar to fall out of grace with the church? And why did God allow this innocent man to suffer under my dominion for over a hundred years? I vaguely remember this case, but I need more details. Steam and the acrid smelling brimstone smoke that he loves fills the hall. Satan has to lean forward and wipe the screen in order to read the rest of Mavar's tragic story. The little man's face turns crimson with glee as he reads on. Wisps of smoke appear from his ears and nose. His eyes narrow as they dart from line to line, and then gradually they widen in disbelief. Satan pushes his chair backward from his desk, raises both arms with fists clenched over his head, and screams with delight. I love my job! <laughs> Satan takes another sip of boiling water and mumbles. Yes, yes! I believe this will work just fine. Troublemaking is one of the few things that made my existence bearable. Hell in all its terrible glory is boring and not very challenging to a fallen archangel. And hell was not of my making. I am its victim as well as its master. Later that night, Satan sat down again at his desk. He spoke to his computer monitoring system while he typed out commands. Cubicle number 666. Immediately the screen is filled with a view of Mavar's unliving space. 
which is identical to Galileo's now vacant cubicle next door. Thick steam and smoke do not hinder Satan's vision. Navarre sleeps restlessly after yesterday's torture session and his long conversation with Fitzroy. The expression on the sleeping man's face is no different from what it had been for the last 103 years. It is an old, depressed face of a beaten man with tired eyes, resigned to an eternity of suffering. You know, something in Mavar's character impresses me. There still burns a spark of reason in him, waiting to be kindled into a rebellious flame. Now here is a good man, an excellent scientist, and an intellectual who never meant harm to anyone. He must have been shocked when he heard that he had been excommunicated and had no hope of salvation in the next life. Satan is well aware that good people who do not deserve to be in hell occupy many of his cubicles. On bad days, he sometimes felt a tinge of sympathy for him. Satan can easily read the minds of all his tenants. The skill comes in handy when choosing new torments for them each day. But Mavar's thoughts, they were always the same. Mavar wishes for spiritual death, the total extinguishment of his soul and consciousness. He wishes for peace and eternal sleep, free of pain and regret. Therefore, Mavar is the perfect candidate for deconversion. I like that term. Control panel? Mavar wakes the next morning back in his cubicle, but is now comfortably cool. The temperature, usually 100 degrees, is barely 70 degrees now. His smoldering straw mattress has been replaced sometime in the night with a comfortable infirmary-like cot with clean linen. Mavar swings out of bed, ready for trouble. What is going on, Satan? What insidious trick do you play on me today? Mavar, dressed in a threadbare knee-length shirt, shivers in the coolness of his cubicle. As if having anticipated Mivar's discomfort, an imp approaches and offers him a robe which he gratefully accepts. Mm -hmm. The imp scampers away but soon reappears with a breakfast tray. It sets the tray on the lone table in the cubicle and stands by to watch. Mivar cautiously approaches the table and examines the food. There are eggs, bacon, toasted bread, and berry jam, an orange, and a tall glass of water with ice chips. It was all quite amazing to Mivar. He had not experienced such a breakfast since before his death. Breakfast in hell usually consisted of stale bread, moldy cheese infested with maggots, and putrid hot water. Mivar muttering to himself and the imp curiously watching him. I'm suspicious of this kindness many times before. I have been led to believe an improvement was in store only to have my hopes shattered by Satan, the master of mind games. Mavar cautiously sits down to sample the food. When he is convinced it was real and not another satanic trick, he eagerly consumes everything while the curious imp watches. Mm, um, mm. Mm, that's good. Here, here imp, have some bread. Mm, yeah. It appears Satan doesn't treat you any better than the rest of us. Hmm. Mivar, having satiated himself, scanned his little cubicle. It contains a table, a chair, a bed, a chamber pot, and basin. A bookcase is filled with Bibles, a good sampling of all the Bibles ever written. Long ago he had had enough of them and stopped reading. They contradicted themselves, they were filled with inconsistencies and the greatest atrocities ever committed upon man. Mivar speaks to the imp. Ah, imp, I am distressed that the Holy Catholic Church has strayed from God's true word. It has always been my mission while alive to reconcile yeah. science and religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ah, unfortunately, my efforts were undermined by the church teachings and dogma. Are you, are you listening, Imp? 
you know, during my later years, I became a scientific and festering thorn in the side of the church. This I know. Yes, I had to be publicly discredited. And what better method than excommunication, almost on my very deathbed? Oh. The church felt obligated to punish the dying scientist for my well-intentioned but dangerous efforts to reconcile science and the scriptures. So what does your Lord have in store with me today, Imp? Good morning, Professor Mavar. I trust you enjoyed an unimpaired, restful sleep and your gourmet breakfast. What? What? Who? Who speaks? It is I, your master. The one who has cared for you since your death. Who else could it be? God? <laughs> what, what, what do you want from me? I have not disobeyed you, have I? No, 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 not at all, my dear Mavar. Would you be so kind as to join me for a cup of tea and some biscuits? In about 30 minutes, your imp will guide you to my desk. While he waits, Mavar freshens up at his basin. After 30 minutes of nervous waiting, his cubicle door swings open, and the imp, who had been sitting cross-legged on the floor watching, springs to its feet. It drags Mavar out of his cubicle and down a dark hall lined with doors. Mavar notices that the plaque over the door next to his no longer has the name G. Galilee on it. Uh-oh. What has happened here? To my knowledge, it is the first time a name has ever been removed from a cubicle door. The imp leads Mavar to the elevator. They enter and as soon as the doors close, the elevator drops rapidly to the bottom floor. Its abrupt stop crashes its occupants to the floor. As the doors open, billowing steam pours in and takes Mivar's breath away. The imp helps Mivar to his feet and then pushes him into a vast steam and smoke filled room. A narrow red carpet leads away into the swirling steam. Huh. Where do you lead me, imp? The creature pulls Mivar along the carpet until he sees a dark shape ahead. As they approach, Mivar makes out what appears to be a desk and two chairs. Finally, when he stops in front of the desk, a little man with balding head, rosy cheeks, and a pudgy nose steps out from behind the desk. Welcome, my dear Professor Mivar. I am Satan. Thank you for being so prompt. Please have a seat. Judging by your puzzled face, I am sure you do not recognize me from our previous meeting. Please forgive me. That horrible appearance is standard procedure for greeting all new arrivals. Nevertheless, I am the evil one. Trust me. Do you mind if I call you George? Ah, well, call me what you wish, Satan. I care not. George, how about a cup of hot tea? Oh, excuse me. I'm sure you would prefer iced tea. Imp, get our guests some iced tea. The imp sets the goblet before Mivar and fills it. The sly smile creeps upon Satan's face as he studies the old man before him. He is enjoying this encounter and hopes it will lead to as desirable results as did the Galileo affair. George, I have some news for you that may upset you and please you at the same time. Would you like to hear it, or would you rather not face the truth? Truth is not always desirable, especially when it destroys comfortable faith. You, Professor Mavar, have attempted to live two lives simultaneously, like many other humans. One life was based upon reason and science, and the other was based upon superstition and fear of the unknown. <laughs> but before you begin, Professor, I sense there is something else on your mind concerning the dissolute and detestable Admiral Fitzroy. My answer to you is no. I will not give him special attention, except to increase his torture somewhat. He is deserving of nothing more. Uh, you are probably correct about Fitzroy, Satan. 
Uh, what you said about me is also true, although I have not realized it when I was alive. I suppose I did avoid facing the truth because my faith afforded me a better deal, security, acceptance within the church. I did try to live two lives at once, I am sure, one of science and one of blind faith. And most humans do exactly as I do. Most humans seem to adjust well to this dichotomy, as did you. Unfortunately, your conciliatory solutions to the debate between evolution and superstition came to the attention of the church. Due to your reputation and past loyalty, the church could not very well tolerate your authoritative voice speaking to the masses. Your words undermine the dogma of the church. You were brave, but quite stupid to contradict the Pope. Yes, yes, I now realize why I was persecuted. I did not think the Church of Jesus would react so violently against me. Your basic beliefs differed little from your contemporary Alfred R. Wallace, who now shares a small portion of credit with Darwin for the concept of evolution. By the way, he also suffers as you in hell. Unfortunately, your name has been lost in history. Only a few scientists and even fewer clergy know your name. The very church that condemned you to hell does not care about you, and in fact hopes your name, like Galileo's, will never be mentioned again. You are an embarrassment. Yes, yes, I suppose. A truth blinded me to the danger that lay in my path. I had faith that Jesus was with me as I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Had I known the church would betray me, I might have made a different decision. Bravo, George. I admire your spunk. You defied both Darwin and Huxley, and then the church. While you burned your candle on both ends, your fellow scientist Charles Darwin defied the scientific community and the church. He was, however, immune to the barbs and slings of the church, because he did not believe its doctrine or in its God. But you, George, you were not. Your blind faith in the Pope's infallibility made you vulnerable. That is why you are here and have suffered in my domain since your death. Satan sips boiling tea from his cup and stuffs several biscuits into his mouth, waiting for Mivar's reply. Ah, <sighs> well, I know, I know. I deserve my punishment because I grievously undermine the church's authority and teaching. But it was unintentional. I do accept my fate. Oh, how contrite you are, Professor. But why should you accept your fate? I have the distinct pleasure to inform you that the great Galileo Galilei was your neighbor and lived in the cubicle next to yours until three days ago. At that time, the Catholic Church admitted after centuries of review that it had made a mistake in its condemnation of him and his views. The church presently accepts his concept of the universe as fact. Such a reversal was inevitable. But it took so long. Poor Galileo. How he must have suffered at your hands in this terrible place. Oh, thank you for the compliment, Professor. But I was merely doing my job as instructed by our Heavenly Father. In all honesty, I can neither accept the blame or the credit, for I am but one actor in the universal plan of my master and your God. Galileo created his own hell because he had blind faith that heaven and hell really existed, as do you. Oh my God, can it be true? I can't believe it. Did you know, my dear professor, that your beliefs, the ones that you debated with Darwin, are now very respectable? 
at least with those who believe in intelligent design. Your theory of God, as the author and designer of evolution, is today the very basis of Catholic doctrine concerning the evolution of life. The Church now echoes your own words, quote, Christian thinkers are perfectly free to accept the general evolution theory, unquote. Do you recall writing those exact words? Ah, <sighs> yes, I do. The Church tried to censor me, but I would have none of it. The Roman Church today cannot improve on your sentiments, spoken over a hundred and fifty years ago. You also wrote, We have a true reconciliation of science and religion, in which each gains and neither loses, one being complementary to the other. Your words, George. Your words! Yes, I did say that. I know. I know I did. Congratulations, Professor Mavar. Your theory finally prevailed, but alas, you did not get the credit for it. No mention of your name was made when in the year 1996, Pope John Paul II announced to the world that there was no conflict between belief in God and biological evolution. I think that the Pope did not want to remind the world that the Church had made another blunder concerning your excommunication, especially on your very deathbed. You can well understand and sympathize with the Church, can you not? Oh no, I... I... This can't be true. I can't believe your words. I cannot reconcile the fact that the Holy Roman Church now believes exactly what it had excommunicated me for. It's, this is a terrible irony and a terrible injustice. How true, George. And you are correct. It is a terrible injustice. Have some more iced tea, George. Tears fill Mavar's eyes again, and soon he is weeping uncontrollably while Satan silently observes. During the first years of hell, Satan regretted what he had to do, but now after thousands of years, he is unmoved. This is just another suffering soul, and he has little sympathy. His real interest is embarrassing God in the Roman Church, or any religion that believes hell is a real place. To that end, he will help this miserable human soul who now weeps pathetically before him. <laughs> Get control of yourself, Professor. Things are not as bad as you fear. If the Catholic Church gave Galileo a pardon, why should it not give you a pardon, my dear Professor? You have suffered enough. <laughs> Can it be true that I actually have a chance to quit this hell? Or is it just a cruel trick of yours to give me one fresh breath of hope and then a second breath of your burning brimstone and disappointment? I assure you, Professor, it is no trick. I would be delighted to release you from this hell, although the Church has not investigated your case as it did Galileo's. I have my ways of making them reconsider. Shall I proceed? Here is my hand, Mavar. Let us shake hands on our momentous agreement. Hmm. Should I take the hand of you, the great evil one? Would my gesture be seen by God as an act of disloyalty? Would God believe I was in league with you? To manipulate the Roman Church? Would this handshake bring on the wrath of the Almighty One? Well, on the other hand, what worse punishment could possibly be given to me? I suffer daily by the will of God. I am waiting, Professor. Here is my hand. If you refuse this offer, then surely I have chosen poorly. You will be unworthy of my offer and effort. To Satan's pleasure, the old man's trembling hand slowly reaches across the desk and into his outstretched hand. The handshake is momentous, a great achievement even for the great Satan. Never before has a lost soul ever received such an offer and accepted it with his free will. 
I am truly moved by our courageous act of reason and bravery. It is difficult for the human soul, a product of evolution, to overcome the influence of ignorance and fear of the unknown. You are truly a brave soul who is worthy of my interest and effort. Now the real work must begin, and it will be a challenge even for me. A challenge even for you? What, what must you do? I will do what I can to influence the Church Fathers, but there are no guarantees. I will review your case and bring it to the attention of those who have the power to help you. Yay. I can do nothing more. Leave me! <laughs> the cubicle is as he left it, clean, bright, temperate, and well stocked with those items that will make the following days bearable. Mivar's torture schedule is cancelled indefinitely. He has nothing to do but wait. Satan, on the other hand, is already busy creating a devious plan to help the brave man of science. While Mavar anxiously waits for news from Satan, he marvels at the church's belated acceptance of his theory concerning creation and evolution. He's puzzled about church doctrine. He turns to the nearby imp, and although knowing he will get no reply, he asks, How is it that the church has made so many gross errors concerning science? Is not the Pope infallible? Hmm. Why have men of science been persecuted? It makes no sense to me. The church has betrayed what God surely intended. But why? Who knows? I don't. How could anyone accept church doctrine as being true in the light of its many past errors? And what role does God play in nature? It seems to me, none. Unlike me, Darwin believed that creation and evolution of life were natural phenomena. I concede that evolution is God's work, but Darwin did not. Darwin, I expect, was an atheist, and he was immune from the wrath of the church and fear of God. To Darwin, heaven and hell did not exist. But unfortunately for me, they do. I do not fully understand the mechanism by which variation in plants and animals develop, but it obviously happened. I always accepted it simply as another element of God's plan. I remember Darwin's words in his letter to me, that he did not recognize any such godly power. Natural laws, he claimed, run their course without plan or direction from a divine power. The very next morning, after a restful night's sleep in his comfortable bed, Mivar finds an addition to his library of Bible editions. Sitting on top of an ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament is a book entitled The Laws of Inheritance by Gregor Mendel. Mivar picks it up and eagerly starts reading. He can hardly bring himself to put it down. He devours it while waiting to hear from Satan. I, I can't believe this. Can it be true? It seems Darwin was right. Here is the mechanism of Darwin's yeah. evolutionary theory. Yeah. Oh my God, the church was wrong again. The following is a memo from Satan's personal files. During the time of sleep, there is a time for dreams, dreams that cannot be controlled by volition or ecclesiastical law, dreams that respond to hunger and passion Dreams that arise from the firing of neurons stimulated by causes unknown to man. I have long been accused of being the source of disturbing and lascivious dreams. Dreams powerful enough to influence human behavior, change the direction of human events, and even create nighttime erections and orgasms in sleeping popes and cardinals. Once I became aware of this ability to reshape the human mind, an ability endowed upon me by God himself, 
I have used it frequently to tempt and twist those who are susceptible. And there are many to tempt, including the Pope himself. Now, as I plan my strategy, as generals plan war, dreams will be my weapon, and the portal through which I will attack the infallibility of the church in my rescue attempt of George Mavar's soul. Tonight, the Pope will dream. Shortly after retiring for the night, the frail Pope John Paul II began a long succession of dreams. Visions of poor souls, victims of church blunders, visited and tormented the Holy Father in his dreams. As it turned out, they also visited every one of his most entrusted staff as well. The Satan Dream Network would have been the envy of any internet aficionado. Such was its effectiveness. It took several days for the dream virus to increase in virulence and come to a festering head. In due time, the name George Mavar predictably came up in a Vatican Council meeting and discussions followed. The Pope in good conscience felt an obligation to request a review on the Mavar case. He instructed that the research be kept under the strictest secrecy. Satan was pleased. His plan seemed to be working. Exactly six weeks later, the inhabitants of hell heard a deep rumble and felt a strong vibration that shook every cubicle and torture chamber. The imps wondered what Satan was up to. George Mavar had no idea that he was the cause of this most unusual event and continued to wait patiently but fearfully for the voice of Satan over the loudspeaker in his cubicle. Finally, on the seventh day of the seventh week, the silence in his cubicle is broken by Handel's jubilant Hallelujah Chorus. And then the gentle voice of the little man who drank tea is heard on Mavar's intercom. Good morning, Professor Mavar. I have news for you. Please be ready in half an hour for a meeting. The imp will deliver you. George Mavar paced anxiously at his cubicle door for 20 minutes, waiting for it to open. It opens exactly on time, and an imp escorts him to Satan's office. He's pushed out into the smoke and steam-filled hall. In short order, the imp leads him to the bowels of the great hall, and to the large desk and a benign-looking little man. Satan greets Mivar with a broad smile and extended hand. Good morning, Professor. I'm so glad you could attend this meeting. Ah, as am I. I was afraid I would not hear from you. Mivar reluctantly shakes Satan's hand again, and then sits down to hear his fate. He thinks to himself, Hmm. Tell me, Satan. Will I suffer in hell for eternity? Or will I be released to some other fate? The answer, unfortunately, is not immediately forthcoming, George. Iced tea and biscuits come first. I am curious, Professor. What is your definition of hell? Mivar's answer is a compilation of church teaching and legend drawn from both fiction and art. It is a thorough and colorful description, identical to Mivar's personal experience. Fire, brimstone, agony, pain, torture, etc. Satan listens patiently while sipping on his boiling tea. When Mavar finishes answering the questions, he asks, Have I not described hell in all its terrible reality to your satisfaction? No, my poor Mavar, you have not. Here is the current, and therefore the correct, definition of hell, as written in a recent issue of the Vatican newspaper. It is the official pronouncement of the Catholic Church. Apparently, the definition has changed since your days upon the earth. Satan tosses a small newspaper across the desk to Mivar, who reads the article over several times and then, in astonishment, looks across the desk into the deep black eyes of the little man. Satan smiles and repeats from memory the Pope's actual words as written in the paper. Here are the Pope's own words. Rather than a place, hell indicates the state of those who freely and definitively separate themselves from God. 
the scriptures use symbolic language that figuratively portrays hell as an actual place in the bowels of the earth. But, but Satan, I did not freely and definitively separate myself from God. And if hell is no longer an actual place, how can it be that well, I am here with you at this very moment? <laughs> An excellent observation, my dear Mavar. That, my friend, is for you to figure out, as Galileo did. I have no doubt you soon will understand. You are wondering how successful I have been in my attempt to arrange a pardon for you. Those were Mavar's exact thoughts. Mavar leans across the desk and clasps his hands together in anticipation, as if praying. He quickly thinks better of it, lowers them, and firmly grasps the arms of the chair in which he sits. The Pope has formed a committee to investigate your case. He is sympathetic to your cause. There are, however, more conservative voices in the Vatican, which advise him to be cautious and proceed slowly and carefully in the matter. The Pope is an old, frail man, susceptible to persuasion. Consequently, and unfortunately for you, the Vatican has decided to give your case the same fair and deliberate consideration that it gave Galileo's. <laughs> you may be looking at a century or two, wait, before the matter is resolved. Damn the church, damn the Pope, and damn you, Satan. Where is the justice? Well said, Mavar. I agree. Fortunately, I still have a few connections in heaven, and so I have it on reliable authority that the Almighty One has been well aware of your plight and the inaction of his church. He is also sympathetic to your cause and will, most probably, not object to your full pardon from hell. Mivar's spirit soars. He can hardly believe the good news. At last, he might be released from the torments of hell. Can it be true? But how much longer will I have to wait? I, I can't stand it any longer, Satan. Mivar breaks down and weeps while Satan watches him passively. Satan neither <laughs> smiles nor frowns. Mivar can see no hint of emotion in the chubby little face, and it worries him. <laughs> uh, is there more news yet to come, Satan? What haven't you told me? As I have indicated, the Vatican Council is a very deliberate body embroiled in bureaucracy and politics. There is a distinct possibility that the Church will forget your cause when this Pope dies. In addition, the church will soon be so distracted and embarrassed with the pedophile sins of its leadership and the resulting lawsuits that you will be forgotten. If I were you, Professor, I would not get my hopes up too high. Satan seems to enjoy the anguish of the poor soul before him. He enjoys announcing the shortcomings of the Catholic Church, or any church for that matter. He enjoys stirring up trouble for his sponsor. Satan, like Mivar, had little to lose and was never one to follow heavenly protocol if he could avoid it. Satan holds out his hand into which a waiting imp places a large serpent skin covered book, the unabridged catalogue of heavens, the same one he had loaned Galileo not too long ago. After a brief explanation of its contents, Satan pushes it across the desk. Study this carefully, Professor. If, or when, the day comes that you receive a pardon, you will have to decide where your miserable soul will reside, if any place. There are many other man-made heavens out there from which you may choose. The Viking Valhalla, the American Indian Happy Hunting Grounds, the sexual heaven of Islam and Hinduism, and many thousand more ancient and contemporary. The Catholic heaven is not mandatory. By its initial rejection of your soul, it has given up all rights to it. What? How, how can that be? There are other heavens? I can't believe it. No one ever told me about it. I didn't know that. As you will discover, 
The religions of man offer you many choices other than the Christian heavens. Furthermore, the index of this catalog contains a complete alphabetical listing of all beings that have ever existed on Earth and where they are spending eternity. Look up names of scientists like yourself, or politicians, or clergy, or royalty, or even just the common man. You will find that some dwell neither in heaven or hell. They have made other choices. Choose wisely, George. <laughs> Mivar returns to his cubicle with Satan's Heaven catalog. Its study occupied most of George Mivar's time until that day on July 22, 2010, when the future of his soul was determined. Satan was not surprised by Mivar's liberated selection. The history books of Heaven and Hell are unclear as to what happened to George Mivar's soul. The last recorded mention of his name in Satan's files was that he checked out the unabridged catalog of heavens from Satan's personal library. Thereafter, his name disappears from all records. It is rumored in the torture chambers and cubicles of hell and in the cathedrals of heaven that a secret deal was struck between the forces of good and evil. The church was spared the embarrassment of having committed another Galileo-like blunder, and Satan had another delightful distraction from his boring existence. The rumor alleges that a diabolical compromise enabled a human soul to escape the clutches of Satan for the first time in history without an official pardon from the church. Sounds of diabolical laughter periodically resonated throughout Satan's domain, and it is claimed that the din was even heard on earth by human ears. That evening, Satan sat at his computer. He pulled up the innocence file folder once again and made the notation, location unknown next to the name of St. George Jackson Mavar. Satan scrolled down to reveal the next name in the file folder. He nodded his head in approval and began to work. <laughs> <laughs>